First of all, can I uh, first welcome you to this uh, lecture tonight. Um, Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests and colleagues, as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at Liverpool Hope, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to what is our first distinguished public lecture in law series, and to particularly introduce former High Court Judge Professor Sir Mark Headley in a moment. Um, I suspect that Judge Headley is known to many of you in the audience, and uh, certainly given his standing and stature in the legal profession, in Liverpool, in the community, and indeed beyond, he may not need a huge introduction, but I will do so if I may. Uh, having previously served as a judge on the Northern Circuit Court, he was appointed in 2002 to the High Court, where he served in the Family Division before he retired in 2013. He made history by being the first judge to allow journalists into the Court of Protection in May 2010. Uh, not an insignificant action, in fact, probably contentious in its own way. So in his career, he's always supported, where possible, media coverage and broader public discussion of the legal cases, which he argues is important for society as we grapple with many of the complex social issues around children, healthcare and mental capacity and the like. Indeed, his willingness to embrace the media may have a historic origin in that looking behind his biography, I found that both his father and brother had worked for national newspapers uh, in Fleet Street. So maybe that's where it stems from. I'm not sure. I'm sure Sir Mark will comment on that later. Sir Mark has passed judgment on a number of high-profile cases in the fields of criminal, family, end-of-life, medical, and mental capacity law. In 2004, he ruled in the case of the premature baby Charlotte Wyatt, deciding her life support machine should be turned off. So in lots of cases, in a number of instances, he's faced particularly challenging and difficult issues. He's also appeared as an expert on ITV documentary series Exposure. He's been a visiting professor for the Judicial College and is currently honorary professor of law here at Liverpool Hope University. And we are delighted he's joined our newly formed law department where we are committed in our LLB and our combined honours law programmes to providing students with a broad-based legal education that both combines the philosophical and I think the practical and applied approaches to law. This chimes well with the university that's committed to issues of social justice and in the context of Liverpool, I think. So Mark is also a practising Christian an Anglican reader in St. Peter's Church in Everton, and Chancellor of the Anglican Diocese of Liverpool. He has previously been attacked in The Guardian, indeed, for his faith and his views, as well as his membership of the Lawyers Christian Fellowship. In responding to this in an article in The Independent in June 2013, he noted, it's hardly worth having a faith if it doesn't influence you. What you have to do is remember you're administering a secular law because from a faith point of view, I remind myself that all Christians are volunteers. So you can't compel the faith on anyone. If people choose to live their lives in some way, other way, then they're not to them, and I respect that. So in many respects, I think we will see in his lecture tonight and in his series, a person who is both a committed legal scholar but one who's very aware of the social context in which he works, and a person who's extremely compassionate, I think, in his approach to the application of the law and his concern for people and broadly society. He will deliver the first of this series of six public lectures as part of our law series here at the university, and issues under discussion in the lectures will include things such as televised trials, the infallibility of truth, state interventions in people's private lives, and whether the role of the judge is fit for purpose in today's society, which I suspect is where he will lead off from tonight. It's interesting, we sit here in the context of a refugee crisis 
in the UK, as many of you might have noticed in the papers and on the media last night. 300 eminent lawyers have already said Britain is not doing enough. So in lots of ways we should be informed, and I'll be interested to hear Sir Mark's comments about the relationship between the law and politics. I think it's time for me to stop and hand over to those who are better qualified than I to comment on the subject. Uh, I invite you to uh, welcome Sir Mark Headley. Thank you. I've chosen the trial judge for two reasons. First, because it is my own experience. And secondly, because it is to the trial judge that very wide discretionary powers are given. I'm far from convinced that most people even know what those powers are, let alone whether society truly consents to their use by their judges. It's therefore necessary to describe that before turning to what is the key question in this series, do we exercise the powers that we have with the informed consent of the society in whose name we judge? In any discussion about the law in this country, the focus of most people is on the criminal law. Yet that is not the area that the powers of the judges have so expanded over the last 40 years that I've been in practice. That expansion has been seen primarily in the field of civil law, in housing law, family law, law relating to the mentally ill and those who lack capacity to make their own decisions. The emphasis in this series will be on family and mental capacity law, partly because they have seen a dramatic growth in those discretionary powers and partly because my own experience lies primarily in those fields. Those indeed are the two areas where discretion is most controversial, but it isn't confined to them. In housing law, for example, a judge may have to decide not only whether a landlord's entitled to possession, but whether in all the circumstances it would be, quote, reasonable to grant it. Or again, where a court's considering an interim injunction before trial, it will not only consider whether the claimant has a good, arguable case, but whether even if he has, it is just and convenient to grant an injunction. These provisions are designed to enable a judge to achieve justice in the individual case. There are very few prescriptive rules in relation to the exercise of discretion. Judges are entrusted with wide powers to achieve just solutions in individual cases. In these lectures, I want to reflect not only on what those powers are and how they're used, but also the values and principles that have underpinned them. These matters, especially in the field of mental and capacity law, lie at the heart of our system and, in the end, depend on the informed consent of the community in which these powers are exercised. There is a further reason why the question of discretion is important. The appellate courts have been very reluctant to interfere with discretionary decisions. They will readily intervene where the judge has got the law wrong in any way at all. They will intervene a little more cautiously over questions of fact, particularly where those are based on documents or inference. They are, however, very reticent if a judge, having got those matters right, exercises discretion and comes to a conclusion that was reasonably open on the evidence. And nowhere is this more true than when issues of welfare or best interests are under consideration in family or mental capacity law. If I review what, for me, are perhaps my 20 most interesting or demanding cases as a High Court judge, no more than two or three of them have gone on appeal. Now, that's not to say I must have been right in the decisions I made, but rather that they were exercises of discretion which were, in effect, beyond challenge, though hopefully they also achieved a solution with which all parties decided that they could or must live. This difficulty of challenge makes understanding discretion very important and we shall return to it again more than once during the series. 
Now, although it may be true that many judges come from similar cultural stables, though that is changing all the time, they do tend to be very diverse in their own moral, political, and philosophical views. Indeed, there will hardly be a view which can lawfully be expressed in society which will not be represented somewhere in our judiciary. Moreover, judges tend to have quite strong personal value systems. That was probably something that inclined them to be a judge in the first place. The value-free judge does not and should not exist. Judges are, however, united in one view, their own fallibility. None of us are right all the time. No human being ever is. You cannot do the job I did for very long without that becoming very apparent. Humility is an essential quality of the good judge. Not always easy to reconcile with the confidence that the judge needs in order to make the decision for which the parties are waiting. For us to understand and scrutinize the role of the modern judge, it's necessary to have a little historical and philosophical context. The judges have been on the scene for many millennia. Human beings seem to be essentially social. We seem to need to live in relationships and in community. Whether that is because we were made that way or simply by chance have evolved that way might not for this purpose matter. That is the way it is. Successful hermits are something of a rarity. It also seems to be the case that human beings find wrong easier than right, especially when the pressure is on. The result is that our history is littered with aggression, violence, injustice, and suffering. Indeed, that we're here to tell the tale at all is because our race has discovered and imposed restraints on human behavior. Some restraints are voluntary, like the adoption of a religious faith or a specific moral code, but most from earliest recorded time are imposed in the form of laws administered and enforced through a judicial system. It's a feature of the ancient Middle East civilizations from the third dynasty of Ur about 4,000 years ago through the Hammurabi Code and the Jewish Torah and on through the Greek states to Roman law. And that's without considering the rest of the world, let alone the advent of Christianity. When the writer of the book of Judges in the Hebrew Scriptures observed in that book's closing words, quote, in those days Israel had no king, everyone did what was right in his own eyes, he was describing neither liberty nor utopia, but anarchy. Humanity as a race cannot, it seems, survive without restraints. What distinguishes order from chaos is the presence of effective restraints. What distinguishes one society from another is the nature and extent of the restraints imposed and the manner in which they're enforced. What distinguishes tyranny from liberty is that the effective operation of restraints is oiled by law and justice rather than naked power and might. However one may look at it, it seems that integral to a peaceful society is the effective and respected administration of justice. Now we can trace the early origins of the system we recognize in England and Wales from the reign of Henry II, which as you will all know was from 1154 to 1189. Indeed, 1189 marks the formal start of modern English law, it being the date on which whereof the memory of man runneth not to the contrary. Law starts for us in 1189 with the death of Henry II and the accession of Richard the Lionheart. Justice in medieval England was seen to repose in the person of the sovereign. But Henry decided that rather than go round the country and do it all himself, he would appoint others to do it in his name. Thus was born the Assize and the High Court Judge, from which our present system has developed over the last 850 years or so through many a turbulent phase. 
This bit of history actually remains important as the High Court judge today can still exercise an inherent jurisdiction based on the royal prerogative rather than statute. And the best current example is found in the idea of wards of court, which still flourish from time to time in the family division. Now all this is intended neither as a profound history nor sophisticated jurisprudence. It's simply intended to set the scene for understanding the role and nature of the modern judge. That judge stands in a very long line in the human experience of trying to live harmoniously as social beings. The fundamental task of oiling the machine with restraint, uh, a machine of restraint with justice remains the same. The ways in which it is done and the social context in which it works have, however, changed almost beyond recognition. There will be some of us in this room who remember social conditions in the third quarter of the last century. But even so, it's not always easy to grasp the extent to which our society has changed over that time. Perhaps a way to glimpse it is to imagine a judge of the probate, divorce and admiralty division, for so it was, from, uh, shall we say, 1955, coming to sit with me in the family court of 2015. The family division itself was not created till 1971 and the unified family court only in April of last year. Our first female judge was appointed in 1962 so our 1955 judge, male of course, would find it all very unfamiliar, perhaps unlike the criminal judge who would still recognize the essentials of the system in which they worked. Our visiting judge would, I think, be shocked at what he would see as a lack of deference towards Her Majesty's judges, uh, and in particular, their exposure in the modern climate to public criticism in the media. As it happens, I think judges are still generally held in good standing. But in those more deferential days, and especially when out on the assize, they went in the name of the king and were treated accordingly. Our judge, however, would be astonished at the powers possessed by the modern judge and the area over which those powers now range. His experiences in family law would have been limited to private disputes over money, over divorce, and sometimes over children. He would have seen his role as decision maker as applying the agreed norms of society to the facts as he had found them, thus producing a just result. Now, in the area of private and family life, it would still have been possible in 1955 to have spoken meaningfully about the agreed norms of society. That's not to say everyone conducted their lives in accordance with them, they certainly didn't. But there was a broad social consensus in favour of marriage against divorce, in favour of conceiving children in wedlock and their being brought up by both their natural parents. To talk today of the agreed values of society in this area involves much chasing after the wind. They simply do not exist in so clear a form. And judges have inevitably been significantly involved in absorbing and reflecting both change and the wide diversity in our society, which is being fueled by developing concepts of human rights, medical technology, immigration and birth control. Indeed, judges have sometimes been, if not always willingly, the instigators of change. Our 1955 judge would have been equally astonished at the range of cases which confront the modern judge in this area, including medical cases, often addressing issues of life and death, and the rapidly developing choices inherent in the concepts of welfare and best interests, both for children and adults. Perhaps his greatest surprise of all would lie in the range of the discretionary powers that are now given to judges. 
These are the powers to be exercised once the evidence has been heard, the facts determined, the relevant law identified, and then applied. In a complex world, not only has the range of issues increased, but so has the choice of ways to confront those issues. And thus there may be more than one just and reasonable outcome available in any given case. Those discretionary powers both allow the judge to make a specific decision and to serve the welfare of children and the best interests of the incapacitated to achieve a just solution in an individual case. The capacity of the human race to produce a set of circumstances never foreseen by the legislator is well known. And in our society, this is met by the exercise of judicial discretion based on rather general principles specified in the legislation. The dramatic advance of our technological skills, especially in the field of medicine, now means that society is confronted by problems it has simply never had to deal with before. Our ability to sustain physical life has meant having to make choices of how and when to end it by the refusal or withdrawal of treatment or other approaches. I was speaking at a conference, uh, an ethical conference at Great Ormond Street recently, and a consultative intensivist was saying, nowadays, children only die when we allow them to. That such is our technical skills that we can keep children alive, however pointlessly, for almost as long as we choose. Developments in reproductive technology pose similar problems. When the first overseas commercial surrogacy cases came before the court, and they, as it happens, were all listed in front of me, it was necessary to work out how to apply a statute to something that the legislators had never had in mind when they passed the statute. Our difficulties are increased by the apparent fact that our technological skills outstrip our ethical skills we know what we can do, but we are much less sure about what we ought to do. And judges, too, have frequently found themselves on the horn of this dilemma. It is often in these highly technical and often emotive cases that the role of the judge is brought into question. Judges, after all, are neither qualified in medicine nor child development, let alone in paediatrics. How is a judge to decide between competing expert views? Surely it would be all better if we left it to a tribunal of suitably qualified experts. Now I want to suggest there are three reasons why the judge is better placed than anybody else to make these decisions. The first is this, that actually the judges become skilled at evaluating expert evidence, and in particular in evaluating what is truly impartial expert evidence. Take the example of baby shaking, which we will come back to in the next lecture as it happens. There are a group of self-professed experts whom one hears in court who simply do not accept that shaking can cause the symptoms that are normally, others normally associate with baby shaking. Uh, the triad of uh, injuries being the classic example. Likewise, there is a group of experts who see shaking round every corner the moment this kind of injury is mentioned. Clearly, because you all too often find both experts in the same case, one instructed by one side and one by the other, as you can readily imagine, um, experts have, are human too, they have their prejudices and fallibilities like everyone else, and a determination has to be made as to who is to be relied on in the circumstances. Secondly, actually, most of the decisions with which we're talking about 
are not simply expert cases. Take the example of the withdrawal of life support systems, whether from a child or from an elderly person. Actually, the family will have a view about this, and it is a view that ought to be heard and heard carefully and impartially. The judgment at the end of the day, although influenced by technical medical evidence, is not actually a judgment on technical medical evidence. It is a human judgment in which the technical med medical evidence and the views of the family and indeed anyone else who has something to contribute have to be judged in the round and as a whole. And the third reason that I would want to contend that judges remain the right people to decide these kind of cases is perhaps the most important reason of all, and it's this. Any just and peaceable society uh, must have uh, the means by which a binding and authoritative resolution of a dispute can be brought about in disputes between citizen and citizen and between citizens and the state. The more complex and diverse the society in which we live, the more pressing the need for that contribution. Judges are given by society the status, independence and authority to do just that. They generally act in public, or at least their judgments are publicly available, whereas almost all expertise is conducted in private and subject to confidentiality rules. They set out their reasoning in public, which can and should be considered, discussed and challenged, as you will have the opportunity to do with this lecture shortly. I'm called the Honourable, given a knighthood on appointment, dressed as, addressed as my Lord in court, not because I crave it, although it is quite nice, uh, certainly not because I deserve it, but because my essential purpose is to bring finality to disputes by a binding and authoritative decision. Now, of course, this has all come under much closer scrutiny since the European Convention on Human Rights was incorporated into our domestic law in 2000. It is the duty of the judge to ensure that every public body, which includes the court, respects the human rights of every citizen. Now, generally, identifying human rights is fairly straightforward. What is difficult is resolving conflicting rights between citizens. Almost every family case infringes someone's right to private and family life, as does the making of a care order in respect of the child or the reception of an unwilling adult into a care home. And of course, nowhere more so than in making an adoption order to people who are strangers to the child. Those involve a dramatic incursion on the rights of individual family members. And the resolution of the conflict of rights rests on less sure foundations than many would like, as the conflict between family life and free speech uh, will, I think, illustrate. I tried some care proceedings some time ago in which I concluded that a mother had killed her child whilst he was an inpatient at Great Ormond Street Hospital by infusing uh, salt into his milk feed. Now this was a boy of nine and you would have thought that nobody could actually take an excessive amount of salt because their taste buds wouldn't allow it. But of course, he unhappily had a, a nasal gastric tube in, which meant, of course, the entire taste system was bypassed. The salt made its way into him. He had a cardiac arrest and a died. His younger brother was uh, placed with his father. The mother, 
unsurprisingly, was arrested and charged with murder. Suddenly, the guardian for the surviving child turns up with Queen's Counsel and asks me to uh, grant an injunction preventing the report of the mother's trial as to report the trial would be a grievous incursion of the Article 8 rights of privacy of the surviving child, which of course they would be. Immediately, the press, equally armed by leading counsel, turn up and say, ah, but we have Article 10 rights of free expression, and uh, under no circumstances can you stop us reporting a criminal trial in open court in the press, and however hard we will try to protect this child, we have that right. And you had about as clear a conflict of human rights as you could possibly have. Now, of course, the poor old trial judge has to decide these things urgently because the trial's about to start the following day, and I decided that I would not uh, stop the uh, reporting of this case, mainly because the, tr the facts were so unusual that any mention of the facts at all would immediately identify to anyone who knew the family exactly what was going on, for obvious reasons. Well, <clears throat> I gave this uh, brief judgment just before uh, Christmas, and the parties then all went to the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal, in a very long and extremely learned judgment, held unanimously that the learned judge had failed to analyse correctly the questions which he'd been asked to address, but by a remarkable coincidence had come up with the right answers uh, to the questions had he only got round to asking them in the first place and therefore my decision was upheld. Uh, the parties then all went to the House of Lords who in another long and learned judgment said oh no, the learned judge actually correctly analysed all the questions that he was asked to deal with but he got one of the answers wrong but as that answer didn't particularly matter his decision will be upheld anyway. Now I tell you that really to make the point as how extremely difficult the balancing of human rights, conflicting human rights, can be. There were eight astonishingly clever people, I don't include myself in that, but three in the Court of Appeal and five in the House of Lords, who struggled to really to get to grips with uh, what it was all about. And interestingly, their solution was to uphold the trial judge on the basis there must have been a discretion at work there which they were willing to go along with. What the House of Lords decided was that the correct approach was to weigh up all the pros of upholding Article 8 and weigh up all the pros of upholding Article 10 and uphold all the cons of not upholding Article 8 and all the cons of not upholding Article 10 and then bring them all together. And in the immortal words of the leading judgment, the judge is then required to strike a fair balance. And that is it. That is the intellectual foundation on which conflicts of human rights fall to be determined in our jurisdiction. How far everyone is happy with that, or what the alternative could be, is of course matters we could argue about. Before seeing how all this opens up the rest of the series of lectures, let me just say a word, if I may, about court sitting in public. Uh, the Dean was kind enough to mention in his introduction my uh, involvement in a court of protection case. Um, traditionally, family decisions and cases involving those who lack capacity to make their own decisions were heard in private in deference to the personal and sensitive nature of the subject matter. Uh, we do not have to have our personal affairs, our tax affairs, our right to earn money, our choices about whom we spend our time with or where we live, ventilated in public. And we would deeply resent it if they were. And so you can understand why. There has always been a tendency to privacy in these cases because those are the very issues that are under discussion. This privacy is a well-acknowledged exception to the general rule that justice is done in public, as laid down by the House of Lords in 1913 in the seminal case of Scott. However, as society has become more complex, 
and the powers of the judge correspondingly wider, there has been a real public interest in knowing what these powers are and how, when, and why they can be exercised. And that is a tendency which is entirely understandable and in um, a democracy uh, cannot, you know, have to be accommodated to some extent. The modern tendency, and I've had some hand in this, is to open the court to scrutiny, but to preserve the anonymity of the parties involved, which necessarily involves a real restriction on what can be reported. There is no doubt that this is a developing area of the law, and any approach inevitably involves a compromise between competing and perfectly legitimate rights. At the end of the day, Parliament must have the final say in this, as they have, for example, on the question of televising courts. The courts belong to society and not to the judges. However, on a day-to-day -day basis, the judges are responsible for managing this tension between transparency and respect for personal privacy. In ancient Rome, transparency was achieved by simply building courts without walls. But in our country, both climate and a concern for privacy rather militate against that. However, the tension between transparency and privacy remains. The whole question of televisions in court uh, remains an urgent matter. At the moment, if you uh, go onto the right channel, you can watch the Supreme Court and you can watch the Court of Appeal in most of the work that it does. And it is mind-numbingly tedious for the most part. What people really want to see are real trials with witnesses and arguments and cross-examination and things. And that's the very thing so far that has been vigorously resisted so as to prevent uh, us going down the road that some American trials have gone down and which, as a society, we are not yet ready to follow. As I say, no doubt in 10 years' time we'll be in a very different place to where we are now, just as we are now in a very different place to the one we were in 10 years ago. This remains truly a work in progress. In this series, I hope to demonstrate that our judges not only do, but should have the wide discretionary powers they presently exercise. I hope to contribute to a greater public understanding of what those powers are and how and why they are used and to show that society, although it should remain vigilant, can safely give its consent to their use. We shall look at the quest for truth in our system, the principles upon which the state can intervene in private lives, where the values come from that underpin the discretionary system in terms of welfare and best interests, and then finally to look at the vexed issue of sentencing in crime. All these areas have their dangers. All these areas require vigilance, but each should be talked about openly and frankly. And that is my aspiration. Thank you very much.